little different than probably a lot of the traditional stuff. Um, if you've been to any of my talks, uh, any of my other ones, not this year obviously, but uh, I get into a lot of psychology about the way that people think and there's a lot of science involved in, in the type of topics that I do and that this is no different. So I have a very academic background. I work in IT. I work for Red Hat. I'm an architect, a certified architect at Red Hat. So I deal with this stuff day in and day out and I kind of pair that with my academic background. And so as we go through this, there's going to be stuff that might sound a little hinky, just stick with me. They'll, I'll get to a point eventually, I hope. So, um, <clears throat> postmortems are difficult for most companies, okay? That, they, they sit down and everybody thinks that they have some sort of post-incident analysis, but you're probably doing it wrong. I can almost guarantee that. I've been at Red Hat eight years, and I think I can name two or three customers in that time that actually do this somewhat decently. So, most companies are attempting to answer the question, what went wrong? Okay. We're going to put aside the fact that that's actually the wrong question. Okay. You have some sort of incident that happens, like maybe your storage goes out and your VMs crash, and you know, after you've brought everything back up after a 48-hour marathon, you sit down and try and figure out, well, what went wrong? However, it's not what went wrong. That's not really what you care about. What you care about is how do I not do that again? Okay. So you're asking the wrong question. It's very important to ask the right question. If you've got the wrong focus, you're going to be looking in the wrong place. Or put a different way, if you're heading, if you're not pointing in the right direction, you're going to go in the wrong way. That, that's just all there is to it. So far, we're just kind of warming up here. There's some important terms that I just want to put in the back of your head, and we're going to talk about them as we go. I'll sort of define them here, but it'll become clearer when we use them in context. I just want to bring them to the front of your mind so that when you hear them, they're not completely foreign. So first one, everybody's probably heard of this, root cause. I hate this term. Okay? We're actually going to change this term as we go along, um, and we'll talk about why. We're going to talk a little bit about mechanistic reasoning. So this is the idea that computers and automation and, and all of that kind of stuff, that is always the answer to everything. Okay? We had a problem, we need more automation. That's mechanistic reasoning. Then there's backwards accountability. So there's forward accountability and backward accountability. Backward accountability is this idea that I did a thing, and then I'm going to get punished for it. You look back into history and say, okay, we're going to hold you accountable for that thing that you did. This is how laws work. This is, you know, you go into a store, you steal something, you get a fine or you're banned from the store. That's backwards accountability. Then there's this idea of counterfactual. So a counterfactual is any idea that hypothesizes something that might have been. Okay. So it it is, if you think about that logically, a fact is something that has happened, it's verifiable and proving. Okay. Counterfactual is anything that hasn't happened and you're just kind of theorizing. And a lot of people get stuck in this idea of counterfactuals, which is not useful. And we'll, we'll talk about this. And then failure. Okay. Obviously, most people know what failure is, uh, but it's the implication that I want to talk about a little bit. When you say failure, this implies a knowledge of an outcome. Okay? Most people do not set out to do something dumb. If you say, well, you failed, then that implies that they deliberately took the wrong path, right? or you did something wrong. And so we need to think carefully about the words that we use, because at the end of the day, the way you get better is by extracting information from the people that have sat through the incident. If you use the wrong wording, they shut down and you can't get good information. And we'll talk about this as we go. So almost all industries have done some sort of post-incident like post analysis. Okay? This has happened all over the place. But the problem is that we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And as Albert Einstein says, I, I know the people in the back might not be able to read that. It says, if you always did what you always uh, did, sorry, if you always do what you always did, then you'll always get what you always got. We haven't reevaluated the idea of how we're handling incidences after the fact for a very long time. And because of that, we fall into the same mistakes over and over and over again. 
So when you start off looking at a root cause analysis, which is what they tend to be called, everybody calls them something different. I've heard Merck, I've heard, I've heard all kinds of terms. But one thing that's common is people talk about a chain of events, right? A chain implies a linear progression, at least to some extent. This happened, and this happened, and this happened, and that thing over here. And when this broke, everything broke, right? That's the chain of events. The problem is, when you are discussing chain of events, you know all of the outcomes. So you're able to like pick apart every link of every decision that was made and say, that's where the problem is. And as soon as you take this mindset, you're actually starting to assign blame. Blame is very important for postmortem because the goal of your postmortem is to understand why something happened. If you're blaming people, the defensive is not actually going to uncover the root cause, like the, the main cause of why something happened. People will get defensive and they'll, they'll dodge or they'll find something to, uh, some way to shift the attention off themselves. That's not what you want, right? The focus here is not about the individual or anything like that. It's something happened, why did it happen? That's it, that's all you care about. It's really hard to look back though. Everybody looks back and, and we think, well, why was this taken instead of that? Why did you, why'd you call this person and not that person? It, this idea of hindsight makes us exaggerate our own abilities. So when you think about looking, especially if you are using the hindsight against something you didn't do, you think I wouldn't have done that. We all do it. It doesn't matter how, uh, how modest you are. We all sit there and think, well, I wouldn't have done that. Or why did they do that? This is obvious. Or like, even if you don't say it out loud, you make like that face that's like, hmm, you know, why'd they do that? But when you're in the situation, you don't have the benefit of hindsight. You don't have all the answers. You didn't know the outcome. So hindsight makes postmortems really, really difficult. So one of the things that usually comes out of a postmortem is like, automate all the things. Fantastic. Mm, maybe. So the idea here is that when people start stressing automation, they believe that the system itself is perfect, right? If it wasn't for those pesky humans, it all have been fine, right? This also leads to, in the long run, a, a culture of neglect of the systems because it would have worked if people didn't touch it, so don't touch it. And that's how you end up with a box in the corner that nobody knows what it does, but don't touch it. I had a client, um, and we, we've all heard these, but when you experience it, it's completely different. So I had a client, and I walked into the data center, and no word of a lie, nothing but this box about this big with two cables running into the center of the room and this box sitting there. And I was like, what does it do? Well, I have no idea. They just didn't turn it off because they didn't know. So they're paying for this entire room in the data center for this one stupid box because they didn't know what it did. Like everybody has these stories, but if you, when you actually walk into a company and you actually see it with your own eyes, it's just like, you know, like I, I can't even imagine. And they were deathly afraid of unplugging this thing. Like it's been there since 1980 and like it'll be there till it dies. So, um, I, on the screen, there's this little bit about the Google car or whatever. Automation could be anything though, right? Any kind of situation like an Ansible playbook or a build job or anything like that. The problem is that with automation, there is, there's a whole host of other problems. So I'm not anti-automation, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, but automation is not always the answer. And there's, there's a whole raft of reasons why. So, I'm gonna walk you through uh, a real world incident. One of the things I like to do is not talk solely about tech and give you a bunch of tech examples. We're actually gonna pull things from real life and stuff that happened in other industries. So the Los Alamos facility is, they, they do a lot of nuclear research for both the nuclear plants as well as nuclear weapons and stuff like that, okay? And uh, at the turn of the century, like 2003, 2005 in that area, uh, they had two classified hard drives just Missing, gone. So investigators came in and of course because of the sensitivity, they make a lot of noise about 
aggressively pursuing the, the uh, investigation and accountability and discipline are par paramount and they're just making all this kind of noise, right? So after several weeks, the hard drives mysteriously turn up behind a photocopier. And this is in an area that's highly trafficked and had been searched before. And this was kind of a mystery, like, we've searched here, how did these hard drives get here? And as they progressed, what happened was they were ev eventually able to identify the individuals who had the hard drives. And the investigators were like, well, they're just a bunch of bad apples, they breached protocol, they're negligent. And the case closed, dusted off, right? Except not so much. Uh, they went on to suffer not one, not two, but three additional lost hard drive incidences in the next couple of years. So eventually, they called in a third party investigation, and what they found was that there were systemic problems in um, things like people would take shortcuts, and this was because timelines were accelerated and budgets were cut, and there was just so much pressure, and they found that the regulations were too onerous, and that there's all kinds of environmental stresses, and because of all of this, there's a, an entire culture of skirting the rules. So people would just lift the hard drives and take them home because they had to do their work. Or um, to get access to this one computer, it took four people to walk through the area to get to the computer and like, you know, fingerprint scans and all the rest of that just to get to this one computer so somebody could do some thing. So they just loaded up hard drive and took stuff away with them. Um, and so, it wasn't until they actually brought in this third party that they discovered why they were having these breaches. It wasn't because one bad apple, it was because we have like the systemic problem. So, this leads us to this idea of human errors, okay? When you're dealing with postmortems, there's human errors and there's, of course, like machine errors. Machines make mistakes. Even though like, we, we like to think that they don't, they do. They're not perfect. Anybody who's interacted with chat GPT or anything like that won't be able to tell you that, right? So the stuff that happened at Los Alamos wasn't specific to them. It's pretty much can be applied anywhere. So unlike this guy on the screen, so I know that this is pretty terrible for the guys and the, for the people in the back, but um, it goes something like this. So the boss is saying every work group has one sadistic nut that likes to uh, make job unbearable for everybody else. So he hires that guy. And then um, the guy is so crazy that he becomes indispensable. So uh, <clears throat> my comment on that is like, unlike this guy who's just certifiable, most people are not trying to be bad at their job. They're not trying to be crazy, right? People want some level of accountability. We like to be recognized for our jobs. We like to be recognized for the knowledge that we have. It's built into us. Even if you're in a, like an extreme introvert, it doesn't matter. There's still a sense of belonging that you get from a thing you do. Like maybe you hate your job, but there's something in your life that you're proud of or that you want to, you know, talk with other people and get recognition about. When the problem is, is a lot of businesses associate accountability with responsibility and you might end up being given accountability for things you can't change. So it's really important that accountability is applied across the board at, and perceived as fair. Okay. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about, you might not be able to change, but the idea here is like, this is a cultural mind shift. When you're talking about how we used to do things and how we're evolving and our understanding is being applied, we're talking about like a cultural change overall. So when an investigator comes in to look at an incident, it's really important that your organization has someone that is understanding, like they know the problem domain. Um, and that's really important because one of the failures is you might have this good post-incident thing and they assign a PM. And no disrespect to project managers out there, but most of you don't understand technology. So having you lead an incident response is probably a bad idea. Overwhelmingly, people want to make sure that the, these incidences uh, are recapped by other people other than management, especially, especially when the management pretends that they know. Like everybody knows that person that thinks they know everything and they haven't touched the technology for 15 years. We hate that. We definitely don't want to be talking to that guy when we're trying to explain what went wrong. So 
I talked about this a little bit. I, I tend to uh, restate points. The right question is not what. The right question is why. We're trying to fix the problem of human error. If we're trying to fix the, like a mechanical problem, then the question of what is a little more relevant. But when it's a human problem, we care about why. Only by knowing the factors that led up to whatever you're dealing with can you actually fix it, right? Just because something broke, like if, you got, if you've got a, okay, I had, uh, I had some work done on my yard and uh, there's this giant tree stump in my backyard and the, uh, the landscapers came in. They're not woodworkers, they're not arborists, you know, they do landscaping. And they bring out this chainsaw and they melt the chain to the bar because they didn't know what they were doing. So he goes and gets another chainsaw and does the exact same thing and melted two chainsaws because he didn't understand why it was happening, right? And that's it's really important. If you want to stop that thing from happening, replacing the chain, which is the what, right? What happened? Well, the chain melted. That didn't actually help them because they didn't understand what was happening. So back to reality, as it were. So there was this big study um, dealing with pilot errors. And they, they looked at 650 pilot error incidences over uh, between 1950 and 2000. And what they found was that under pressure, your instincts are heavily, heavily used. Doesn't matter how big your training is, it has to get to the level of instinctual reaction, okay? Um, and most of the errors that are happening are because the environment was different than what the people were expecting. The switch wasn't in the right spot or the gauge didn't tell, it was in this unit, not that unit or whatever it was. They looked at things like, well, did the type of airplane make a difference? What about the severity of the accident? Did that make a difference? They also looked at things like, well, did they need more experience? Because obviously the, the number one thing that happens when an accident happens is like, hey, that person just didn't know what they did, were doing. They needed more training, more training, more automation. That's always the answer to everything. However, this large study found that there's actually no statistical significance between the errors made by really advanced pilots and the pilots that are, you know, just starting out. And it came, comes back to the idea of like, if the tooling is not what you expect it to be in a crisis, it doesn't matter how experienced you are, you flip the wrong switch or whatever, you're, you're gonna have a bad time. So, this idea of the, the tooling needing to conform to the user is very important, right? When you're talking about why did you make that decision in light of the environment that you were working in. Okay, so I worked at a place, everybody has a war story like this. Some people I'm skeptical whether it's actually their story. But this actually happened um, at a company I worked at. There was a, a guy, he deleted a production database. And the issue was he had a bunch of terminals and he tabbed to the wrong one. Like legitimately happened, it was a bad time, right? The, I guess, investigation, if you could call it that, just determined that he was working, they had assigned him too much. Essentially, um, we had one database administrator who was really good and three that were okay. And the really good guy just kept getting work piled onto him and piled onto him and piled onto him. And so he's trying to balance all of these tasks and made a mistake, right? So fixing the environment, like overburdening one person is part of the fix here. So. A good investigator asks why something made sense at the time. Of course, if it's just something like that, there's no sense to be made, it was a mistake. But when you are evaluating what has happened and why it's happened, you need to remember it's not a performance review. You're not out there to crucify someone or judge what they did or, uh, or even implement any kind of discipline, right? The whole, purpo the whole point of this is, doesn't matter whether it was me, or Chris, or Noah, or Tiny, whoever was at the keyboard could have made the same mistake. Doesn't matter who it was, right? That's the whole purpose of this. So it's not about discipline, it's not about performance reviews, it's not about the individual, it's about how do you prevent this from happening again, right? Um, <clears throat> and honestly, it's not even about what you could have done differently, because a lot of times, you replace the person who was doing it and they might have done the exact same thing. If the documentation is bad or the link's dead or you know, the critical server is down that has all of the information on it, doesn't matter who was handling the incident, 
you know, anybody's going to make that mistake. So we talked about how failure was an important term. Failure implies a knowledge of outcome. So you walk up to the fork in the road and when someone fails to take an action, that implies that like all the paths are known. You failed to go right. Well, no, I could have gone right, left, center, up, down, right? How did I fail to go that way? That implies that I actually knew that. This, this idea of failure, I'm not trying to remove accountability. What I'm trying to do is help you get to the core of how do I get good information out of people? If you want to, uh, you know, implement discipline or something like that, because that may be necessary, this is not the form to do that, right? You shouldn't be using this as a cudgel to correct action. Chances are, if, if you're looking to discipline a person, they probably have had a history of suspect work. This is not the time to nail them to the wall for it. So looking back, the path is almost always clear, right? As is the future. We, we know the end point, we know where we started, and we can just, it's like doing one of those mazes backwards. Well, of course you're gonna get it exactly right if you start at the end and work your way backwards. Which brings us to this backwards accountability. So I mentioned that backwards accountability is something you've done in the past, and you're gonna be penalized for it now, or there's some consequence for it, okay? So you go to jail because you did something. This is the wrong approach for postmortem. I'm not saying, again, discipline is not bad, accountability is not bad. This is specifically for what you're trying to achieve, which is getting the best information. So instead you wanna practice what's called forward accountability, which is, okay, this happened, you are in the best spot in the company to make sure it doesn't happen again. It's your responsibility to make sure that we get all of the ducks lined up so that you know, if this happens again, it's not, your, it's not going to happen. We have better documentation, better escalation path, whatever. That's forward accountability. That gives people a sense of purpose and, and the opportunity to be a hero. If I get put in that spot, I'm gonna give you the biggest document I can just so that I, like, nobody can say you didn't think about this thing. Or if you did, like, I've turned in 30 page reports before, like just massive, massive tomes. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna be the one that didn't think of one of these, like, edge cases that could have hurt me. So back to our real world example. When you're walking down the street and you stub your toe, right? Do you punish yourself for that? Do you think like, I should have known better. Like all of my life choices have led up to this event and I've stubbed my toe and now I've got to go home and sit in the corner. Maybe, I, I hope not. It makes more sense to make note of the problem and make sure you don't trip again. That's what we're trying to accomplish here, right? You're gonna be a lot more careful next time. Maybe you're not gonna look at the phone or maybe you take a different path or whatever it is, right? It's not, I'm the worst person in the world because I tripped. It's the same thing in computers. So thinking about human errors again. If it wasn't for the, the system, you know, if it wasn't for, for these pesky humans, the system would have saved us, right? And it could be. Computers do really well at a task over and 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 until they don't. And that's the problem. So you've got some sort of automation, right? And your automation starts off, it's really simple. It's maybe it's a couple bash scripts. And again, I'm not saying automation is bad. Okay? Don't walk away from this saying that, that that crazy red hat guy thinks that automation is bad. I don't. But Think about the fact that like, as your automation grows, maybe you add a build pipeline and you start accommodating some edge cases and your automation is growing now because you didn't think of this thing. And very soon, it's no longer like a cube, it's all of these edge cases kind of like smashed in together where it kind of is a little bit onerous. So you undertake this massive effort and you get it back to a square. It's magnificent, except nobody understands it. Right? And that's part of the problem. Automations will break. They're built by humans. Humans make mistakes. Okay. So why, why do we think automation or automation software is going to save us? Why is that infallible, but the person has been working for you for 5, 10, 15 years, whatever, they made the mistake, but the automation, oh, no, no, no. Can't blame that. Like, it's never the auto, it's, the computer never did something wrong, right? So it's, it's one of these things that you need to be really cognizant of the messages that you're sending out. Is there any 
So, so it could be a process, a process problem, sure. Um, and there could be human mistakes, but I can give you, sure. So the question is bas basically boils down to is, um, can you get to the point where automation actually helps remediate human errors over time? Right, essentially is the question, or helps you deal with process, like there's a process problem and not like a, uh, I'd call it a people problem, not a, not a procedural problem. And the answer is sure, but I can name you more than a, I can give you three examples right off the top of my head where automation caused massive trouble. So when a, a BGP route was pushed by automation and then everybody got locked out of their switches and then half the internet went down. Um, <laughs> Or recently in Canada, where um, there was an automation by Rogers, which was one of the major backbones in Canada, took down, like basically the internet in Canada just went down for the day and everybody went home. Um, or if we just take it out of like purely technical, there was automations that, that bankrupted a $44 billion investment company because it traded so many in 10 minutes that essentially in order to uh, to fix the problem, they sold at a loss because they, the automation just fired and just spent all of their money. Yep, there's, there's lots of it. And again, automation's not bad, okay? It's not bad, but you need to really be thinking about that. Um, so at this point, wow, that is terrible. Well, this is, this is my break slide. Nobody can read this. Um, when I've given this talk in the past, people want to like have a little bit of brain break. So this is normally where I give you three minutes to look at this cute cartoon that I gave to my wife. Essentially what's happening is there's a coder and he starts on his, he starts with a very simple problem and then he works through a flow chart and he's you know, working the problem and you know he's he gets to something pretty complex and he's really working through this bug and following the logic tree and then someone comes by and says hey how about that thing that we talked about and then your trail like your thought process is gone and the guy walks away whistling not thinking anything of it so i gave that to my wife some time ago i was like this is what happens when you walk up to me at at home and i'm working <laughs> so uh, at this point like i said normally I give people like three minute break to get water or something like that because this can be a very uh, dense subject, so. <laughs> yeah, most people can relate to that. Yep, I apologize for the, uh, the screen. This is not working out as I intended, but I, I don't even do it justice, especially when you start looking at the this frame right here with pretty complex flow that he's working through. Yep. And you're right, it's going to require almost an entirely cultural shift, right? Mm -hmm. And you, these postmortems are probably built on years and years and years of, of, you know, different sea levels and all these types of things. And this process is now huge, and it's just been what we've done for 15 years, right? Yep. What is your suggestion, and how do you go about starting this change? Because, you know, cold turkey's not going to work, right? And how do, you, how do you start changing the way of the thinking of what's been, you know, done for 15 years in an overly human process? The research says it's right. It's a good, good question. Um, I'm going to park that and see if we can actually get to that part of the presentation. If we don't, we'll absolutely have a sidebar afterwards because um, I don't want to steal my own thunder because then I'm, I'm largely unscripted, but when I get there, I'll be like, oh, I talked about this, click, click, and that's not good for anybody. So uh, <laughs> I try to be as engaging as possible. When, when I went to university, uh, I, so I majored in political science and I got a master's in political science and public speaking is a big part of that, right? And the very first thing I did in, in one of the classes was like, God, these people are so boring. And uh, I, I promised myself I would do everything I could to never give a boring presentation. So I pace and I gesticulate and I make you not read things. And so part of like clicking through slides, like that, that's just not a, 
I'm, I'll do it if I have to, but I try to be a little more engaging than that, hopefully. Um, I'd like to build up my sense of humor a little bit, but I'm, I'm not a natural joke teller. So I'm working on it. I'm just not there yet. Ah, so getting back to this idea about how people think decisions are made, okay? This is very important. So we're getting a little more into the psychology of, of what is actually happening in people's brains, more or less, based on tons and tons of studies. Like, I do volumes of research when I, before I embark on this. So like, I read, I don't even know how many dozens of studies to, to kind of summarize what, what's happening there, because I do my, my level best to not just like read a website and then regurgitate it to you guys. Um, there's no real value in that. But what I can do is I can, I can read, I spent 10 years in university, that's, that's neither here nor there, except that it taught me to read academic papers. Uh, so I guess that's my skill. Uh, <laughs> so what we think happens when people make decisions is they come up to a crossroad and it's quite obvious, like that's the terrible way and this is the good way. And we think about this in like this linear process, right? So looking back, like, of course, the network lag caused the database to have a problem and that brought down the website. Like, of course, like, that's so obvious. When we look back, the risks are really obvious and there should only have been one path. Like, why did we do something different? So we're going to talk about how to catch a fly ball, okay? And this is the way we're going to solidify this idea of how people make it make their decisions, okay? So for some reason, we have a really ab abnormally high expectation for people in technology. I don't know why it is. But we say like all automation should be norm, and of course you should just slow down, make the right decision, you know, like it's not, for most people, it's not high stakes. Like there's a few people that might work with, you know, highly regulated industries, medical and stuff like that, where it's life or death, but most people it's like, you know, take the extra 10 seconds and breathe, like that's what people tell us. But when we apply these standards to other industries or other areas of life, we realize how ridiculous it is. So obviously when you uh, need to catch a fly ball, you stop and you, you think back to trigonometry and you just plug in all the numbers and then you go stand in the right spot and you make an easy catch. Obviously, right? That's what, that's what happens. So you remember trig, this is the formula, the formula for uh, the trajectory of a flying object. And of course you can just like plug that in on the fly, except you don't really know the wind speed exactly or the spin of the ball or exactly how far you were from the person who hit the bat, like the person at the bat. So it's the person in the middle of the, the action, like can you really actually know this? Like we apply this formulaic post-analysis of like, well, this, then this, then obviously this. But it, that's not how things work. What actually works is that the successful players ignore pretty much everything, and they judge the distance according to perceived angle of the ball. So what happens is he checks over his shoulder, he checks over his shoulder, he checks over his shoulder, and ends up running into the wall. He makes the catch, but it's imperfect, and he kind of zigs and zags, uh, adjusting his path all the way along. So the point, the obvious path in hindsight is usually super far from reality, right? If you're in a fluid situation, it doesn't matter whether you're typing or whatever, if you, if you give a damn about your job, you get that sense of adrenaline and that sense of pressure of like, this is on me and it's really hard to stop and think about all the variables. And oftentimes this leads to assuming certainties, right? Like, well, I got paged by the networking team, so they obviously went and checked all of this sort of thing, so then I'm going to go, you know, do my thing over here. And this actually often leads to flawed remediation, because it does. There, it's just the way that your brain works. You, you make certain assumptions in order to help yourself. So, how do we actually make decisions? Now, I'm boiling this down because this is like a huge topic, right? But largely what happens is you get a large number of possibilities and you need to narrow it down quickly. So your brain just like literally discards stuff before you even consciously think about it. So you get the call and one of your options could be, okay, like it's an emergency, it's probably gonna take me a long time, maybe I should call for a pizza. Like you automatically discard that without even thinking about it, but it is a legitimate option, right? So you've, one of the very first things you do is essentially you do, like for the really technical people, you do a B-tree analysis and you just like 
cut off that bottom half and then you cut off another bottom half until you're left with some manageable chunk to make a decision with. And then you start evaluating this based on pros and cons, right? Like, okay, I've got three or four left out of the infinite number of possibilities I might have had. Um, what am I going to do with this? And you make some sort of pros, cons about what you're going to do next. And there's obviously a trade-off for discarding options because you might have actually missed the valid one and you've just discarded it, right? But this is the reality of people having to make decisions under pressure. So there are factors in decision making and there are factors in avoiding decisions. Four factors. Risk aversion. So this is the, the people that are like, well, okay, there's a 10% chance that I'm going to win $1,000. There's a 10% chance I'm going to have to pay $400. So I'm just not going to do it because the risk isn't worth it. Okay? That's one approach to when I'm trying to make a decision how, how things are going to go. The next is this idea of temporal discounting. Okay? Temporal discounting is this idea of like, I'll take $10 now as opposed to waiting for $100. This is like what the payday loan people rely on that idea. Um, and you might be asking yourself, why is this important? In the broader scope of things, if you can understand and kind of identify it. Now, I'm putting on the hat of someone who's actually going to conduct the investigation, right? I'm not the one that has done the incident. I'm now going to be the one trying to extract the information from people. If you can get a sense of where they fall on the scale, it will give you an understanding of how, how and why they made the, the decision flow they did. Now, this, again, this is... This is not something you're going to jump in feet first, like you were saying. It's not, you just don't just come in and just boom, now I'm, you know, good at postmortem. Um, <laughs> there's, there's an art to this, just like everything else. Uh, then there's this idea of certainty effect. So this one is really interesting in that this is where you pick the car based on the color and as opposed to something you might need, like four-wheel drive in the, in the future. So Noah and I are from the north where four-wheel drive is pretty much a necessity in the wintertime down here might not be a choice for you guys, right? So you might pick the red vehicle because it's red and you like red and you don't think you need four-wheel drive. So this is the certainty effect. I know for sure this is going to happen, so I'm going to go down this route. And then the one that uh, affects me the most is keeping your options open. So this is the idea that um, you make the decision based on leaving the most cards on the table so that you don't paint yourself into a corner. Okay. The, there's obvious negatives to this, right? I might miss making a decisive action early on that would cause a cascading effect. So understanding these sorts of things helps you understand, well, Steve was at the controls, why did I do this? And why was it done like this? And you kind of follow that, that path down. But like I said, there's also ways that we avoid decisions. So the first way is the status quo bias. This one's pretty easy for most people to understand. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't do anything. Done. Keep everything the way it is. We don't need to make any changes because changes are scary. Omission bias sounds similar, but they're, they're a little bit different. Okay, so omission bias is like you've got this uh, giant page of options when you're signing up to some like web form, and you don't scroll through and start unchecking things because you don't want to miss something. So you're more, that's why the spam buttons are often opt out because people, the vast majority of people have omission bias where they're just not going to, it's not even lazy. It's, I don't know what will happen if I start unchecking things. And that's that omission bias. I'm going to, um, I'm essentially, I don't want to omit options by taking an action. So it sounds similar to status quo, but the motivation is a different motivation. Then you've got the idea of anticipated regret. So um, I highlighted this one because this one bites the tech industry most. So this is any option that's something that's going to bite you in the future or that you think it might. So we're not going to do that because that could get me in trouble in the future. Like someone might yell at me for this. Uh, this is pretty big in the tech industry and it's just something to be aware of. And then finally, there's the reactance bias. <laughs> This one is one of my favorites because this is the, everybody knows this person. God, they're so annoying. Um, <laughs> this is the person where you're like, okay, we got 15 options. Don't pick that one. And then they just fixate on like that thing you told them not to pick. They're just stuck on it. Like you can't go the entire day and they just keep coming back. But I really want chicken. Well, right. But we can't have chicken because blah. 
okay, but like if I can't have chicken, I just don't want to do anything. And that's that person. And this one can be the reactance bias. That one can be very paralyzing. The other ones, not so much, but the reactance bias is like, I'm just going to focus in on this inconsequential thing that I know I can't do. So if you want to avoid mistakes, you need to know why they happen. I'm repeating, repeating, repeating. It's one of those things like maybe you'll walk away thinking that all I talked about is why did it happen? That's fine. I'll be happy with that. <laughs> um, you need to understand like why people are making decisions under pressure the way that they are. And so you kind of slot in all of this understanding of how people react. Okay. And it's very important. When you want to know why something happened, you're not going to fo focus on those counterfactuals. And again, if the counterfactual is something that could have happened that didn't actually happen. You don't know that it's happened. It's not a fact. Don't focus on that. A lot of people talk about like missed opportunities or some other euphemism for like you did a bad thing. That's not helpful at all, at all. Because you don't even know at the time, like if you, for example, instead of rebooting the server, if you, I don't know, compacted the database or something like that, you don't know that that didn't cause something else, right? So it's not useful. They're also a byproduct of hindsight. So it's this idea that the only way you can have come up with a counterfactual is looking back after things have happened. And that, again, is not useful. It's not a missed opportunity. It's none of those kind of fun words that HR likes to say. It just, it, it doesn't matter. So psychological safety. Uh, I hate the term, but it predated a lot of the diversity, equity, and inclusion movement. Um, I, and so I will use it because that is the, the terminology that if you're looking up these studies that we're talking about. Psychological safety has uh, to do with this idea of giving the people the ability to provide you the best information possible. So in 1999, there is a, a researcher named Amy Edmondson, and she basically gathered massive amounts of data on clinicians. Okay? And what she found was that the high-performing doctors made the most mistakes. And that was a big puzzle. Why was that? They also saved more lives, consequently. So if you, saw, if, if you ever watched House, the, you know, the show that ran for like 10 years or whatever, that's what she found to actually be true. So she discovered that what was actually happening was that the high-performing teams were actually just admitting to their mistakes and getting better from it. They would have a discussion about why it happened, and then they would move around it. Whereas the low-performing teams, where consequently more people died, were actually hiding their mistakes and not getting better. And so most of the time, people were sweeping things under the rugs. Um, it, because of fear of reprisal. They weren't bad doctors. They, they were in a situation where um, it was punitive to speak up or try and correct the situation. Everybody's been in a place where you get your hand slapped for making a, a recommendation for some reason or another. So it's difficult because nobody wants to be the only person to speak up. You need your entire team to be on board. So we're starting to get into the question back there in the back about like how do we do this sort of thing. The first thing, the first step is to try and provide that psychological safety. So if you don't get this right, your morale is going to suffer. So what happens is if you put up your hand and you're like, hey, I, I, we see this problem and you either end up owning the problem or you get slapped down because that was somebody's pet project and you can't touch somebody's pet project you're going to have people just stop offering. And what happens then is people are going to put in the bare minimum. It doesn't say exactly this in the documentation, so I'm not doing it, right? And that is bad. That's essentially like climbing up a sand hill with a weight around your ankle. You might make a little bit of progress, but you're not really going to achieve anything. So in, in SRE, there's this idea of toil and backlog. So you have meaningless work, and you've got a bunch of tickets that you, you've got to take care of, right? The backlog is just stuff that you're, you're piling up and you're trying to pull off the top every time you get a spare moment. When you do postmortems wrong, your backlogs will become meaningless because people are going to stop pulling out of the backlog because they keep getting their hands slapped, and maybe it ended up being their fault because they did that specific thing, 
And so what you, what you really need to do is you shift your mindset away from, again, not, not so much blame in this case, but you're, you're shifting your mindset away from making work meaningless into giving people something to latch onto. So when you have this, when you've got a well-functioning organization, you have this, this Venn diagram of, okay, the organization needs a certain amount of work to happen. You have a certain amount of interest, which may or may not correspond with the skill that you have. So at least at Red Hat, one of the things that we do really well, and I, I really believe this, is that they, we really try to put you in that center where those things meet. Because what happens is that while no job is perfect, if you, if you put people where they're like actually interested in, they're going to have a higher quality of output. Not only that, they care about what they're doing. If, you're, if you like what you're doing, you care about it. And if someone does something like incredibly stupid, you're going to be like, no, that's dumb, right? And that is actually useful, of course. Uh, you probably want to use softer language than that, but <laughs> it can work. It can. But you're significantly more likely to speak up. And so part of this cultural shift, if you do nothing else, starting to figure out how do I juggle my team to get them into areas where they care a little bit more. You can't do a perfect job. Everybody has stuff that they don't like to do. And it happens in every job. But a good step in the right direction is making sure you get people into areas where they actually care about. So how do you grow this? Okay. The first, it always starts with the leadership. This can't be a ground movement. Okay. Leadership needs to be humble and admit their fallibility. Um, this is another thing that Red Hat does usually, usually fairly well. Uh, when there's a mistake, um, the leadership sends out an internal email explaining what has happened, usually. And there's some level of ownership that happens. And this is really important. It, it doesn't have to be weekly or monthly, but it sets the tone for the company if the leadership actually owns a failure. It also helps to like set that as a priority for you. <clears throat> so what you're really trying to do is you're trying to establish a new set of norms. And along with this, you're trying to build in a sense of empathy. Now, if, if any of you have ever met me or listened to me talk, you know that I'm not a touchy-feely person. How I get around building empathy for myself is I put, I'm like, well, that was me. So I'm out to not screw future Steve by this move. And that's the way that I frame my empathy. So maybe that's not empathy exactly, but uh, functionally it, it works the same way. So so I'm thinking about like, well, what if that was me? Like how how am I making my life, future me, better in this situation? And so if if you've got good meaning people, then you don't have to take that approach. You can phrase that however you like. But if, if you've got harder headed people like me, giving a self motivated angle is a useful thing, right? So you don't want to punish experimentation and risk taking within reason, right? Like you're not going to be like, here's the keys, the prod, go have nuts. Like that's just not going to happen. But at the same time, you want to give people the, the ability to uh, feel like they can make an impact somewhere. So you're going to create a space for these new ideas by encouraging learning from failure. Um, I hate that. I feel like it's a buzzword, like a buzz sentence. Everybody's like, oh, well, we learn from failure. I'm like, do you really? I'm, I'm not convinced about that. Um, but it, it's tough because a lot of times learning from failure is just like calling somebody up and saying, well, what are you going to do different next time? And that's not really the, the, the focus of that. It's, it would be more like um, if you can have a dispassionate tech dissection of like, oh, well, on this line, it should have been this. Like, if you can get to that sort of stuff, there, there's learning from failure that's uh, there. But also having the, the more senior people help you by sharing lessons that they've learned openly. Like, hey, I, like, I'll get up here and I'll tell you about the time where like, uh, so there's a, a time, I'm terrible at email. I have to be the worst tech person in the world at email. I, at the company that I worked at right before I came to Red Hat, 
I somehow sent my entire calendar of four years the same invites for the last four years. And, and so I don't know how I did it, but somehow I picked up all of the invitations on my calendar for the entire history that I was at that company and just resent them. And the only reason I knew that this was happening is because one or two people, I, got, I just started getting like a slew of acceptances on these meetings, right? And one or two people were like, this is in the past. Did you mean to do that? <laughs> and it was like this giant catastrophe. And everybody made fun of me. It was, it was terrible. Um, and not at the same time because I can laugh at myself. But uh, yeah, for a long time after that, it was, that's the guy that can't do email. Even, even if you didn't know me, I was that guy, right? So <laughs> I wish I had a way to actually tie that into shared like lessons learned, except maybe tighten the permissions on the calendar. I don't know. I, I don't know how to fix that one. But um, <clears throat> embracing positive conflict. We've kind of talked about this. I'm not going to beat this one to death. But the idea here is that you don't actually want to remove the conflict. Okay? You want to remove the, the name calling and the animosity from it. But conflict actually helps you get to a better result. Right? If you've got just an echo chamber of yes people, you're not going to get anywhere. You need the people to stand up and say, like, no, that's the wrong way to do it. Um, and then a, a very advanced thing, and we're not going to touch on this very much because there's a whole science around when, but like really, really consider the other people when you're having the conversation. So like if you're an investigator or if you're being interviewed for doing the postmortem, think about the time of day. So I'm a morning person. My peak time is like 6 a.m. You call me at 4 p.m., I am done for the day. You do not want to try and extract information from me. So this is, a, this is more advanced, but it's the same thing for the night owls. Like, first thing Monday morning is probably not the right time to ask them to be sharp on their recall. So uh, if you can get to this level, that really helps your processes. So um, I'm going to pick things up a little bit. Uh, there are four stages of... Uh, psychological safety. So the first stage is everybody starts, it's the inclusion stage. This is the stage where mm, we're fear, there's a high fear of rejection, there's some embarrassment, um, you're new to the team and you don't really know how you're going to interact. What, how you level these people up is by making sure they're included. Just, hey, like, why don't you come shadow this meeting? Just, just that level of um, acceptance is useful. Once you get past that, you end up into the next phase and this where this is interesting because you start to have some ideas and so being heard is important you're going to make some mistakes um, you're feeling vulnerable and so being heard is is a challenging situation for a lot of people because uh, if for example i got up there and i said what you know like here's my idea and someone's like okay and then they move on I, I take that very negatively. I would take it much more, I would take it better with, with criticism, but that criticism can be very damaging to someone like my sister who would just like wither under that pressure. So it takes a lot to level a person out of this learning stage. Um, then you've got the active participants. These are the people that are enthusiastic and they're engaged and you know, they're feeling confident and these are the people that are like, yeah, sure, go nuts, go try that thing. Tell me how it works out for you. And then finally, uh, the final stage, these people are innovative and they're creative and um, they tend to be without fear of rejection because they want people to make their ideas better, right? I've got a solid idea, I did this thing, please give me feedback, tear it down so that like, when I put it out in production, it's going to be okay. And ultimately, this is where you want to get to the, the stage of the challenger, but you'll have a mix in your team. Um, so normally this is where another take, I take another break, but I've been rattling on longer than I normally do for that part, so we're just going to move right along. Because I'm going to be stepping on somebody's time soon. So, postmortems. We're going to talk about what not to do, and then we're going to talk about what to do. So hopefully I start addressing some of your questions. So, I mentioned already, we don't want to talk about a chain of event. Chains have a start, a middle, and an end. They're all linked together, more or less. And when you are trying to evaluate why something happened, linear thinking, not particularly useful for that. Uh, you do have to pick a starting point out of necessity, right? So when you're starting an investigation, you have to pick something, 
right? Or else you have no, no point to get your bearing from. But what is often lost, especially when people talk about chain events, things happen simultaneously. It's not like this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It's like, no, this happened, and like, boom, I've got a giant tree of like, okay, database went down, and disk is going off, and I've got 700 alerts, and which one do I focus on? Um, <clears throat> I have an alert talk that I get into that a little bit more. There's some fun examples in real life about that. But um, the, the important part here is that there's always a large number of factors. Okay? I said I don't like root causes. A root cause is just where you stop looking, period. There's always more problems in your environment. So it's, it's the wrong thought process to say, this is was the root cause. If, if you would agree that there are a large number of triggers that can happen simultaneously, how do you have one root cause? Now, sometimes you can have like an overwhelming trigger like the disk blew up and then the machine crashed. But then the question becomes, well, why did the disk blow up? And why didn't we catch that earlier? And like, you know, the root cause isn't the disk because the root cause technically was, well, this caused the cascading effect, but why did the disk blow up? And then why didn't we catch that? And then, and then, and then, and then, right? So semantics matter. So instead, I try to phrase this as like, what triggered the incident? That's a better phraseology than root cause. And again, semantics really matter. You want to resist having a group meeting. Everybody loves to do this. Okay, guys, get everybody into a room. Let's figure out what happened. Nope, this is the wrong, wrong way to do it. Why? Because if you get a bunch of people in the room, and let's say that Sleuth has a different idea of what happened than what I do, but I'm the loud voice in the, in the crowd, I may actually influence his memory. He might be correct, but I, because I'm the louder speaker, I'm going to influence what he thinks. And again, you're trying to narrow in on what are the contributing factors here. And in order to do that, you need to actually be able to have a, a clean representation of what's happened. So the police, for example, do this. They never do group interviews. They, they isolate people and try and get the stories from individuals. We're taking the same approach for this one, okay? Memory conforms to what sounds about right. Yeah, that kind of sounds like what happened, and, and then that becomes group think, right? So in this process, you identify someone who is neutral, that understands, but was not a part of the incident, and that's what's key because they need to avoid refreshing what's in people's minds. So, for example, uh, a neutral person should not say, well, do you remember that disk problem that we had that, that caused that outage from all those VMs? Bad. Because you are then planting the information that you are seeking out of them instead of trying to get the information out of them. Your goal is to let them tell you the story, not for them to tell you the story you want to hear. So there's a whole science behind all of this, right? Um, the, another thing that should not happen that happens in most companies is the persons that are doing, like, we're on the keyboard, write up the report. It's a terrible idea. Why? Well, because there's all kinds of things that happen. So you could have the, the phenomenon where the expert is not the one good at explaining what happened. You could have the, a situation where, rightly or wrongly, the person is justifying what happened because they are hands on keyboard, right? So they have a vested interest to make themselves look the best, even if it's subconscious. So there's all kinds of reasons why the people who are involved should help you reconstruct the events, but the report, however, the paperwork, whatever you do, should not be filled out by them. And again, it needs to be encapsulated properly. Another thing that uh, we need to get rid of is this idea of Occam's razor. So Occam's razor is a thing, and it says basically the simplest of competing theories is probably preferred to the more complex, or more simply stated, the simple answer is usually the right one. However, as we've already established, most people would agree these things are complex, and so by seeking a simple an answer, what actually happens is blame gets entered in. Okay. The simple answer is Steve hit the wrong button. Boom. You know, the disk failed and the monitoring team didn't catch it. Boom. There's blame. You're ha and so the idea that you're going with the simple answer is not actually going to help you. You should have a raft of suggestions at the time that you're done. Okay. 
because it helps avoid blame and it identifies multiple areas of weakness that you might have run into. So I'll give you just a, I'm going to summarize this, but essentially, normally I don't use text and we, it's terrible and we don't have time, but essentially the, the U.S., the, uh, the Department of Forestry essentially says that anything that is going to get in the way of accurate information should be discarded with. And so these are the people that deal with forest fires and critical incidences and rescues and all that sort of stuff. And essentially, um, the, the whole purpose about this is that people need to have a no cost for speaking up, okay? It should not cost you personally for identifying the fact that the phone was broken and so we couldn't, you know, scramble the chopper or whatever it is. <clears throat> and wow, I am running short on time. So we're not going to get done this. I will rip through this unless there are questions specifically. But um, when you are...